Russian Navy 35027 port line comes up from the shed to take water at the end of the up platform at Sheffield Park. These were the last major steam locos to run on Southern Region. Although rebuilt, they're still, still a deal of bullied mastery about them. Some of the initial complications have been removed, but this is still a fast, really excellent passenger express locomotive. The bully boiler will provide you with steam for anything. But now that the complexities of Bullitt's original valve gear have been removed, these are no longer a nightmare for the fittest to service. Well, it was full and bright. I don't know, look at the, even at the name plate. Cast in gun metal in four sections, the outer ring, the inner ring containing the flag of the shipping company concerned. Inside the cabin of the rebuilt merchant navy, things have changed from the original days of Bullitt. We are no longer faced with fully steam reverser, which was uh, sometimes an all or nothing affair. It could lead to interesting things occurring when notching up, and it was not unknown for a bully to fly from forward gear into full reverse gear when the driver's intentions was merely to notch up by 5%. Now we have a perfectly conventional hand-operated reversing gear of a later period with a cut-off indicator shown on a drum as opposed to serrations on a flat plate. We still have the Ajax firehold doors, but no longer do we have the steam-operated treble on the floor. This was sometimes regarded as a boon and a blessing to the fireman, but when he got the foot off the pedal too soon and the door snapped, uh, snapped up on his shovel, then industrial language was the result. The gauge glass fittings are modern replacements for the original clingers, where the water level then showed up as a line against the black. A typical bullied idea lit by ultraviolet light in those days. The one sound of the past remains in this peaceful hum of the steam generator. Speedometer says 100 miles an hour. This iron number is perfectly capable of running off the clock but not on the blue bell with a light railway order limiting you to 25 miles an hour. But in the last week of steam, some very strange things went on with some very run-down locomotives. And one or two got themselves retired a day early as a result of uh, enthusiasts facing folding money in the hands of drivers at Basingstoke and seeing just how quickly they could get the water loop. to draw up at the water column is Mansell S15847, the southern heavy freight locomotive, a very typical Mansell locomotive, built like a battleship, solid frames. Look at the solidity of the coupling rods, the connecting rods, the valve gear. Everything about this is solid metal. They were never known to slip. They were known as the chonkers. They had a most peculiar sound when they were running fast without without steam. I went chonka chonka chonk, chonka chonka chonk, chonka chonka chonk. Nobody can really explain where this came from. It was probably the motion blocks or the tender and loco bashing together. It was a very characteristic sound of these things. Looking into the cab of the S15, we still see part of the Victorian thinking, the regulator handle set in such a position that it's over the firehole door, which guarantees the chance of the, the driver burning himself at some time or other. The tender, although massive, is still flat-bottomed, no longer self-trimming. Two four-wheel bogies, the vacuum reservoirs on the back. A very, very solid job all round. Mansell was renowned for building solid locomotives. The Victorian working environment, a slightly simpler one than that of the jumbo jet. This is all the Victorians needed in 1885. This loco was built by Nielsen's of Glasgow in that year. A simple pushover regulator to emit steam to the cylinders. A 
time primitive lever reverse. Lift the catch and drop it forward for forward gear. Lift the catch and pull it back for reverse gear. A simple steam and vacuum combined brake. Two water gauges, gauge glass and its protector. Tricox top and bottom. The lever to open the fire hole door. Sanding levers. And here the water control handles for the injectors and a handbrake. And a lovely little pull-out lever whistle handle, not even a modern chain, just pull it forward. Nielsen works by 3209 Glasgow 1885. It seems amazing that this loco survived on British railways right up into the 1960s. Three of them were kept to work the Lyme Regis branch from Axminster. Their very light axle loading and their flexibility on the very sharp curves of that line made them absolutely perfect. And so many locos were tried to replace them and, and were unsuccessful. This one has now been modified with a mock Adam stovepipe chimney to give the impression of its appearance when it was built in 1885. In my view, it's a shame. It, it's not entirely accurate and uh, it does nothing for the locomotive at all. Two of the Brighton Terrier locomotives, nearer to me, 32636 Fenchurch, built in 1872, possibly the oldest loco still in working order on any of the preserved lines. Beyond it, number 55, Stepney, the first loco to come to the Bluebell Railway in 1960. It's amazing how these Victorian artefacts have survived, but they were needed by British Railways right up to the 1960s to work the very difficult little branch down from Haven to Hailing Island. The timber trestle across the water from North Hailing demanded the very lightest of locomotives, and these Brighton-built machines fitted the bill exactly, and there was never any point in scrapping them as long as they were still in such good mechanical order. The most distinctive feature of these locos is their exhaust note, described in a memorable phrase by Hamilton Ellis as sounding like the popping of champagne corks as they went along. extraordinary animal. When this came out in the 1940s, it really took everybody by surprise. Bullitt's remit was to produce a powerful but lightweight freight locomotive, and he did this by eliminating all the trim, no running plate along here at all. Drivers were totally surprised to look out the window and see the wheels and coupling rods flying round underneath them. No conventional boiler cladding. You can see the extraordinary shape of it. Was there ever a better 440 than the school's pass? It would have to be a, a rather strange sort of row enthusiast who said yes to that question. Mansell's design, which came out in the 1930s, really was perfect power. It's amazing how much power was packed onto four wheels, 67 tons. They were perfectly capable of working 400 ton trains at an average speed of 55 miles an hour. They were designed, well not exactly from a standard kit of parts, but this was a cut down King Arthur boiler, modified Lord Nelson's cylinders, and the design was intended to work expresses to Hastings, to Portsmouth, to Bournemouth, anywhere in fact where it was needed. There was a compromise in that the cab was bent inwards at the top to get through the narrow gauge tunnels on the Hastings line. For a tall person like myself, this guaranteed cracking the head at regular intervals, but it was a small price to pay for a loco which combined so much power with grace. They were remarkably 
this was riding locos for a 440, there was none of the violence that uh, came with locos such as the London and North Eastern Shires and Hunts. They were solidly built, as were all Mansell locos. Never short of steam. The farmer's friend, the driver's friend, everybody's friend. And it is gratifying that three of them have survived into preservation.